Hello, and welcome to an unexpected podcast. My name is Tim, and with me as always, we have Matt, Devin, and Mick, and Robert and Evan as well. Um, on this week's episode, we got quite a bit to go over. Um, we're going to be going over some lists that Matt and Evan are taking to a tournament. And then we're also going to be going over uh, the new models and terrain pieces that came out at Articon, as well as Mick's experience at Articon. Um, so we'll go into the list first. Uh, before we go into that, actually, I want to uh, let everyone know we did start a Facebook page uh, where we'll be going over and posting more lists that either we uh, go over or any lists that we may take to tournaments. So if you're interested in looking for that, go to our Facebook. It's an unexpected podcast. Um, so we'll go into Evan's list first. Let me just pull that up real quick. So, Evan, if you want to go over your list real quick. Well, actually, I, we should probably talk about what the tournament is first, just so we yeah, if, Evan, if get some context here. Um, yeah. So, obviously, as you can see by the top of the page, it is an 800-point tournament. Um, there weren't that many restrictions as far as I could tell. I think it was you couldn't take impossible allies, and there were no Tom Bombadil, Goldberry, and Smaug. So none of the seemingly problematic models and no uh, impossible alliances. Tom Bombadil. Yeah, this is the second tournament in a row that I've yes. gone to that banned Tom Bombadil. And I, I have to say, I, I don't know what the problem is. But it, that, there's really not one. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. But yeah, there's, there's some weird things you can do with him in like um, Fog of War, where you can choose to protect him as one of your heroes and get three free victory points. But uh, really, you can, you can get around bad. that. You can, paying you can 160 have points for him. Anyways. I mean, does anybody actually take bom- Tom Bombadil competitively? Yes. Uh, yes. Oh, well, I guess Matt is the lone <laughs> person. Uh, taking well, I, well, I mean, so this is this is for a tournament in D.C. This is the, the DCHL tournament that is kind of taking the place of Nova. Um, and it's in the same Nova location. So it's in the Crystal City um, Hotel. I mean, it, one of the reasons my wife is not going to this tournament is because you know, she can't play the Anson Tom Bombadil list, which is the, the list that kind of works for her because she can't bring Tom Bombadil. So oh, yeah, I forget your wife plays Tom Bombadil. Yeah. I mean, I, well, I mean, I dig it. Tom Bombadil makes, there are certain lists that Tom Bombadil makes competitive and the, the end heroes list is, is one of those. And my wife who's vision impaired, you know, can only see big things like trees and, you know, somebody wearing a, you know, yellow pat, yellow pants and a, and a yellow hat. Um, so, yeah, that's a good list for her. Well, anyways, um, those of you who have uh, listened to our previous episode, I believe, where we review uh, Mick's Articon list and uh, mine and my father's list for NashCon probably recognize uh, at least some components of this list. Um, so compared to that other list, uh, my four heroes have changed ever so slightly. I've still got the Witch King on Fell Beast with three Might, 14 Will, three Fate. I don't have the Morgul Blade in this particular iteration. Um, I have the Shadow Lord as well, but Shadow Lord is not on horse. And then instead of a basic Wraith with minimal stats, I've got an Orc Captain because he's a bit cheaper. And then I've still got the Spider Queen and a Bat Swarm. And compared to my other list, I've got... Uh, 16 Black Numenorians, and then a total of 17 Orcs with Spears. Uh, not Morans this time, just normal Orcs. And one of those 17 Orcs also has a banner. Uh, along with them, I've got two Warg Riders with Shields. So in total, uh, it's about uh, 40 models. It's got four heroes, 10 might points, and two casters instead of three compared to the last one. So I guess a lot of you guys have probably already reviewed at least an iteration of this list, but any more thoughts? So I'm curious on why you got rid of the third caster in exchange for a or captain, specifically a ring wraith, which also has her of March, but I know you're uh, one month. Points. It's 95 points, points less. So uh, I had to drop something um, and I wanted to keep... Um, Obviously, I wanted the Shadow Lord because uh, he's necessary to deal with uh, shooting armies such as Corsairs and Harad and other things like that. Uh, the Witch King on Fell Beast is just such a good assassination model. Um, 
such a powerful model and spider queen and the bat swarm are also extremely critical pieces of the list. So really the only thing I could drop down in the hero section in order to get me more points was to drop that basic wraith um, to an orc captain in order to still get the heroic march, but save as many points as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the points were um, saved by dropping Moran and orcs down to orcs and uh, dropping a couple of uh, pieces in general, just like I don't have throwing spears on the war riders in this iteration, and I don't have the Morgul blade. Um, but what I didn't want to do was drop down on model count, because uh, I generally going below 40 models for me at 800 points is a little iffy, just with the number of scenarios that require a decent amount of numbers. Especially when half of your models are defense four. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I guess just going first here, I suppose. I mean, at, at same thoughts as the last one, you have two big hitters rather than three and 800 points. Normally, you can consider the army a third big hitter itself, but yours is not really. Uh, it's kind of like just a solid force, but not something that I would fear necessarily punching through me. Uh, you've majority strength three, of course, or all strength three, almost except for the Warg Riders. Um, so, okay, so you have two major threats. The Bat Swarm helps where you don't need to rely on a transfix to knock out, like, uh, you know, assassinate somebody, and that's great. Spider Queen does her work. I, I mean, I, overall, it's a pretty solid list. It's just, yeah, that one weakness of if either the Shadow, I'm sorry, the Witch King or the Spider Queen get knocked out, it kind of spells doom for the armor, army almost, but doing that is probably going to be tricky given that you've eliminated shooting for the spider queen, like someone shooting at it. Um, I mean, so it's not, it's not necessarily a bad list. I just do think that you, you probably are in a grind more often than you'd want to be. I mean, did you experience that when you went to the last tournament with this list that you were kind of like slogging it out and weren't really just, you know, mowing through your opponent as fast as you'd like? Well, I guess uh, spoilers for our segment um, for that tournament, if we do it. Uh, I actually ended up winning that tournament. Um, mm. And during that, uh, I played a decent number of sort of unusual style lists. So there wasn't a ton of grinding going on. Got but it. what I usually found was that um, just the power of being able to use my two heroes together um, I was able to kill just a ridiculous number of things. And then once heroes started dying, um, just troops started following. And, yeah. and once that happened, it was pretty much curtains. And then in other games, the sheer maneuverability of the army um, with the heroic march, uh, with the broodlings from the spider queen, with the bat, with the witch king on fell beast, I was able to win a whole bunch of objective scenarios just like with my opponent not being able to do much about it. So I think the list is, is able to fairly easily uh, compensate for its sort of inbuilt flaws. So you never win against another force that like, I don't know, a, a, you know, that could grind through your army. Like I, I'm trying to think like Uruk High maybe, possibly but so uh, again um we might talk about this later but i did play against iron hills uh okay, but that good. that game ended fairly quickly um after i killed his uh captain and dane so okay so then if you i mean yeah if you work fast to assassinate the opponent's heroes then i think once you have a witch king and, and spider queen going uncontested <laughs> the, yeah, I mean, you're probably going to rip the opposing arm to shreds. So it, obviously any opponent who fights you has to focus on getting rid of one of those two, which, you know, not necessarily easy <laughs> either way. Um, but those are my quick thoughts. Okay. Um, anybody else have any thoughts on the list? Any other comments? Yeah, no, it just looks like a, like a solid 800 points. Um, funnily enough, uh, you have 40 models, which uh, based on my experience of last week's Ar Articon, at 600 points, three of my opponents would have outnumbered you. So <laughs> I'm, I'm actually thinking, uh, do you have enough models? <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the list itself looks looks really solid. Like 
the only possible change I would make is maybe uh, how many point, how many will points does your wish king have here? Like 14. 14. Okay, yeah. No, so I, I don't really see any changes unless you really sort of like revamp everything. Um, I would potentially maybe think about swapping Shadow Lord for something cheaper and having more models, but I think the way the, the way you have it is is completely fine. Yeah, I don't I don't think he wants I, to do that. I I wouldn't. I, well, I would with never the amount of models, that. yeah, yeah, you would get shot to death. I mean, right. half his army being defended, yeah, I mean, or I mean, you would get shot to pieces. I mean, you would have to get at least like ten or fifteen extra models or something like that, which I don't, which yeah. Well, also, I think it helps. Very difficult. If you're trying to assassinate a target, you generally pour a lot of energy into it, and you'd mm -hmm. have to mitigate other targets that are a problem at the moment. I think the Shadow Lord helps stop that. Like, let's say you have, I don't know, Boromir plus uh, Imrahil or whatever. As he's killing Boromir, Imrahil can be stopped by the Shadow Lord just pinging him down. And because he's already wearing him out, by the time the Witch King's like, all right, cool, focus fire over there. I mean, Imrahil's already done for. So, um, so I do... I'm not against him having 40 models with what his list is trying to do. I do agree, though. He's probably going to be the lower end of things, but not by a whole ton unless he's fighting, like, horde armies. Mm -hmm. um, if he was at sitting at, like, 34 models, then I'd be like, ugh. Uh, but given that most of the time what's going to be grinding his army down, especially with Black Numenorians in the front, is heroes, and he has two ways of, like, kind of slowing them down um, or stopping them completely in their tracks... Not against it. That was my thoughts when I was reviewing his numbers. But. Well, yeah, this is it, this is it's completely fine the way it is. It just yeah. you know, if, if you if you wanted to somehow make make up the numbers, maybe there was a way, but I can't really tell at the moment. It's just the, the addition of the spider queen makes it very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I'm out of curiosity. I'm just, what would you be afraid of going against with this list, or what do you think you'd struggle to go against with this list? And I know scenario might have an impact but let's assume it was just a normal you know kill each other kind of situation um the response is still the same uh from last episode i'd say uh the two things i'm probably most afraid of fighting are uh elf armies and galadriel lady of light or doesn't necessarily have to be elves but something that's fight five um mm -hmm. fight five defense six would be uh rather annoying for me uh, because my hurls aren't doing too much damage, my warriors aren't doing too much damage, and a lot of my uh, heroes are going to have to be calling hero. Well, some of my heroes are going to be calling heroic strikes to try and just fight normal warriors, which obviously sucks. And uh, their line will grind through mine relatively quickly. So that matchup isn't ideal, but with the sheer maneuvering power of the list, if I'm not going up against them uh, in a sort of straight-on head-in fight scenario, uh, the list is pretty well. And uh, if I play my cards right, um, if I play on them in, against them in a fighting scenario, I may be able to pull a draw or even a win if I get an assassination on a powerful enough hero. And Galadriel Lady of Light is pretty self-explanatory, I think. Um, shuts down the magic, fights off the spirits. Um, so that sort of takes away a portion of my army that's very important, which is uh, shutting down the heroes with magic and then being able to assassinate them. So I, I'm going to have to make a lot of risky plays if I end up playing against uh, Lady of Light. Um, but I think those matchups are definitely winnable and other than like say i don't know playing goblin town and reconnoiter or something like that where it's just like that's just how the matchup goes i think the rest the other armies that i play against will be completely manageable so so something like borrowing captain of the white tower backed by galadriel with his flag at five five everywhere that might be tricky <laughs> Um, that, that's a problem for this. Don't, don't worry, Mick. I'm not going to this tournament, so he's yeah. fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't. I, I don't think. Um, with the with a couple of exceptions, Rob Loder has released like who's playing what armies for this, and I don't. I did not see. I don't think I saw that combination out there. Well, next next time mm -hmm. I come to America, I'm bringing Foreman Captain White Tower yeah. with Galadriel. <laughs> yeah, I found it shocking that, yeah, with Galadriel's prominence, I mean, it's just like, that, she'd be a serious problem. Well, and, and over in England, she's everywhere. 
I, I I almost brought that list, and j- but just because this this tournament also has a, a doubles component to it, mm-hmm. and basically because Evan and I didn't want to bring to fly with like two entirely separate armies, um, I ended up not you know kind of going that way, so we could have a, a you know an, an evil army and evil army uh, combo that we could just morph into a doubles list. But uh, I had you know I, I had had that not been the plan i think i probably would have been here with a um Bormir of the white tower galadriel combo no, I still if, I, if i had gone to the tournament that's what i would have brought so no well yes okay yeah you would have and then entirely fountain court you would have had three figures three figure types in that mm-hmm. army boromir galadriel and fountain court guard it's all you need to be happy in life yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> wait there would be some rangers i'm sure <laughs> oh no, I've moved away from the found court. I uh, I got sick of no one wanting to play me, so I'm oh. diversifying. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll move on to Matt's list then. So let me just pull that up real quick. Um, Matt, if you want to go over your list. Sure. So this is uh, Corsairs, more Corsairs, and then some Har- Haradrim thrown in. So um, in Warband 1, uh, we have uh, Dalamir. And with him, he's got 18 Corsairs, uh, seven of which have um, spears and shield, uh, six of which have just shield, four arbalesters, and then one guy's got a bow. And then in Delgamar's list, um, uh, or Delgamar's warband, that comes next, and he's got five guys with spears and shield, five guys with just shield, four more arbalesters, and one guy's got a bow. And then the last warband is a Corsair captain. The Corsair captain has a crossbow. And uh, with him, he has um, three guys with shield, four guys with spear and shield, four arbalesters, and one guy's got a bow. Um, And then uh, we've got, uh, for the last warband, we've got Suladan, the Serpent Lord, of course. And uh, with him are three Serpent Riders and two Haradrim Raiders with war spear and bow. Um, so it ends up being 54 models. There are a total of five bows, um, 12 arbalesters, and one Corsair captain with a uh, crossbow, and um, you know, 45 um, five four Corsairs with you know throwing weapons and stuff like that. Well, I guess it's less than 45 have throwing weapons because 12 of them are arbalesters, but uh, it's a whole bunch of throwing weapons in there too. So oh, I've got to ask with Rainier not being here, was this your dedication to him or? Yeah. I mean, this is not, this is, so this is, this is somewhat like a dedication to Rainier. Um, there are a few things I did differently in this list from, I think the way Rainier normally plays it. Um, I wanted to have a, uh, you know, a significant mobile cavalry force in here, which is why um, Suladan just has cavalry with him and there's no um uh there's no you know fatty two-handed choppy guys in the list and there's no haradrum bow or or other stuff i i just was like you know i'm gonna take i'm gonna take a whole bunch of corsairs and then i'm gonna take suladan with some cav um and their role is either to um you know head for the other side of the board if it's recon um or basically sweep around one flank of an opponent while the Corsairs hit the front, um, Suladan and his buddies can sweep around the back, um, trap, you know, basically hit the spearman from behind so that folks are trapped and that the court, then the Corsairs get the plus one, uh, to wound hitting the front. Um, and you know, I wanted to have, I wanted to have enough guys too, so that either in objective scenarios or recon scenarios, I could send, um, you know, three mounted guys to the left, three mounted guys to the right. Um, and I could have two kind of mounted threats that people would have to deal with at the same time. They're kind of dealing with 45 Corsairs in the center. Let's ask, is this the other list which Evan doesn't want to play against? Should be. Uh, this, was, this was part of the reason why I have the Shadow Lord instead of a different <laughs> model like you suggested, Mick. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I, and I think this is the type of list is why he should have the Shadow Lord in that. Yeah. yeah. How many crossbows did you say you have? Uh, I have 12 plus the um, plus the captain. And I'm I'm figure limited at, 
you know, for that. I, I suspect yeah. if I had more crossbows, I would have brought more crossbows. But I, yeah, I was going to ask about the, the bows and why you didn't choose more crossbows, but that answers that. So, well, yeah, I, I mean, that's part of the reason. Um, the having, I, I, I mean, I also, I had a couple points left over. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I had, I had a few slots, you know, for extra shooters that, I could put in and, you know, having a few guy, having a few Corsairs with bows gives you interesting options. Cause you don't want to, you, you, you tend not to want to like dedicate arbalesters to like sitting on objectives, for example, with the Corsairs, you want to put those crossbears crossbows where they can do some damage and support the line. Whereas, you know, I've, I've got three guys who can just go over and, you know, either sit on an objective or like run up to a roof and plank at people. <coughs> And like Evan and I did a test game of, um, uh, and we ended up rolling up Storm the Camp. So we played our list against each other with Storm the Camp. And those three guys with the bows, I didn't want to leave our ballesters back in the camp. I needed them to kind of move forward and advance with the armies. But, you know, they, they stuck themselves in a position where they, you know, they couldn't really be gotten at. They were up on a, you know, they were up on a scaffolding and they just sat there in the camp and they're like, you know, this is my camp guard. Um, so they're they're kind of useful they're kind of useful utility guys to have um you know in, in a position where you want a shooter but you don't want to kind of pin one of your arbalesters down to a static position they're also because they're defense three they're also useful in the battle line because there's like the, they're the guys that like run up and charge the mount you know the big scary mounted hero and then get shot out by the um by everybody else's throwing weapons. Okay. Um, so good luck to both of you. Um, hopefully one of you two will win the tournament. Um, and I, I imagine with these lists, it'll go pretty close to that happening because I can't imagine many people. Matt, do you know how many people are going to be at the tournament? It'd be, I think, 30 people at the tournament. 30, okay. I don't see why, especially because I know you said that I know you didn't necessarily write the list due to what you saw, or maybe you did. I'm not sure, but I, I, I would imagine with 30 um, people, you guys have very strong lists, and then you also know what other people have taken. I think you guys should finish at least both in top five unless you get unlucky in some situations. Yeah, but, but, no, but no pressure, right, Tim? Yeah, no pressure. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> I mean, you uh, have you, have you two ever fought each other on top tables of the tournament? Why has that not happened? Is that- uh, not at top table. We have fought each okay. other at tournaments. Okay. I think actually, well, no, actually we did fight each other at a top tournament in Colorado. Didn't we have, um, were we on top table? I, I don't know. Um, I don't think it was top table. Was it, um, sec- it might've been, been the second to last round. It was a long time ago. That yeah, particular yeah. one. I think the first time we I, went I to seem Colorado, to remember a, a banner going prone and then crawling under <laughs> a goblin town walkway in order to not be shot at and therefore winning the game two zero to you, um, which I'm still not salty about, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that, Matt, yeah, you have the psychological that, advantage. That was is what you're saying. that was a thing that happened. Yes, yeah, that's right. We 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 were playing to the death on this like Goblin Town board, and like and the I banner, also like, remember being relatively close to breaking you and winning the game, and then time being called. But right. anyways, moving past that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so we're gonna move on to the new uh, releases that were at Articon. Uh, and the first one is going to be the Amenhen piece. So I'll go to Rob first. Thoughts on it? I think it's beautiful. Um, I think it's long past due that that is a terrain piece that um, Games Workshop is putting out for players. I know that there are, at this point, you know, a zillion options, whether 3D printed or people have made their own Amon hens for years, but having an official GW or I guess Forge World model that you can put on your table that is, you know, this nice is great. I certainly hope to pick it up. I hope it's not quite in the price range of Weathertop uh, <laughs> since, since it's um, hopefully a little bit smaller, but I think that I have yet to make my own Amon hen. And at this point, I'm just going to wait for this. I think it's great. So, so Mick, you were there 
in person at Articon. Did you get to see these things in the flesh or did you just get shown photographs? Uh, we were just shown photographs, uh, but they were on a very big screen because it was it was a projector yeah. screen. But I, I'm really curious to see how big this thing is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so uh, Rob, Rob was saying um, essentially the staircase, like um, apparently they managed to uh, to get it designed, uh, I think either based on Weta Workshop designs or I don't remember exactly, but uh, they did say something like um, uh, on the staircase, you can actually put two tw uh, 25 millimeter bases next to each other. Oh, okay. So it's going to be pretty big. And uh, on uh, each individual stair, you mean? No, no, no. So like, so like width wise. If, yeah. Oh, width, width wise. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm looking at those steps. I'm not seeing you being able to balance a figure on those. Um, yeah. I was going to say it's, if that's the case, it is oh. enormous. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah it's, a, it's two feet wide. <laughs> it's twice the size of Weathertop. Yeah, but. Um, yeah. I mean, I've got a three D printed version of this that that I've I've done up. So I'm I'm not really eager to repeat all that effort. But um, yeah, it does look like a nice model. I, you know, I was just kind of curious. I can't tell from this whether this is like you know eight inches across or eighteen inches across. I just have no idea. No, I would say it's probably like ten to twelve inches across. Because yeah. if you if you if, if you look at two models on the staircase, probably like two more on the top, and then like two more on the sides or something like that. So yeah, you you'd be looking at probably like eight to twelve inches. Gotcha. Like now you guys all kind of well, uh, there's a lot of people here who run tournaments or go to them frequently, of course. With this being a terrain piece, would you only ever include this on an almond head board or would you just throw this in as a terrain piece to use in just a normal, let's say grass map and it, just be like, okay, maybe this is almond head. Hey, uh, is, is there any circumstance in which you would put this on a table that it would not then become an almond head board? Yeah, so, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I mean yeah, you could I you could put point. it in Lake Town or something. That probably wouldn't be a <laughs> The master just had like a barge bring it in or something. Yeah. <laughs> right. With the grass. I don't know who built this. This has been here for years. Yeah. <laughs> Alfred, open my crate. <laughs> if, if, to answer your question, Tim, it's not generic. Enough. It's too iconic to be yeah. just like random scenario okay. piece or table piece. So yeah, it probably becomes an omnibus board as soon as you throw it down. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, which, it's like weather think, top. I mean, you put that weather top terrain piece down on the table, and it doesn't matter what you've got on the rest of the table. It's it becomes the weather top board yeah. for the tournament. Okay. That said, so, if you don't have a lot of terrain and you're just putting a hodgepodge together, you so you can certainly put it on a board with some like Ascheliath ruins and a citadel wood, and it's fine, right? It won't like look out of place. Right. It'll still become the Amon Hen board because it's got an Amon Hen. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> It is interesting, though, because, I mean, it's like you guys have said, this is one of those things where so many people have recreate, tried to recreate this to put this on a board. There's so many, you know, YouTube channels out there that have done battle reports where this is a piece or you see them at tournaments. So it's really great that this became an official model. And it, obviously, based on looks, it looks amazing. And I'm, I'd really be interested to see how this does in terms of gameplay, having like the ramp and the little places for where you can put your models and you know, if you put an objective maybe at the top of the stairs here, how that functions. So in terms of the gameplay, it'll be really interesting to see how that works. Yeah, um, there, would be, there would definitely be some issues with gameplay because um, if you if you imagine that uh, the staircase might be might be let's say uh, two inches wide, then a Spider Queen is not going to be able to really fit through or a troll or something like that. So well, I think well, they might have, have to go around. Yeah, I mean the, the like, Spider Queen can just run up the outside. Yeah. yeah well, yeah, yeah but, but he means like a I mean, sixty there, mil base. Yeah. Yeah. There are, yeah. There's going to yeah. be situations where a sixty mil model clearly seems like they could just grab you, and mm -hmm. then they can't fit. Yeah. See, I'm not really against that though. I mean, as long as I think the, the key thing is that a 25 mil base model can get through it. And if it's not so big, like Osgiliath ruins are so big that you really kind of need like other models like Cav to get through it. But this is going to be a very small, it doesn't look so big that it's going to be like weather top, right? Like, so it's such a small portion of the board that it, usually this probably is going to go somewhere sort of insignificant. Like you definitely don't want an objective marker on this thing. Mm, yeah. Um, but you know, I mean, denying this very small piece to Cav or whatever else, it, I'm not particularly bothered by it, considering most boards have things that, like, larger things can't get on. Um, that's actually pretty standard, I mean, in my so, opinion. Yeah, I mean, uh, so 
we have we have a version of this that if it is about a foot wide is probably you know if not identical is roughly the same size to this and i mean we put objectives on and in and around it all the time and i mean it works out just fine because even if the even if the big scary monsters like you know can't kind of get underneath that overhang they can get within three inches of the marker that's underneath that overhang and We'll you probably climb this thing anyway. To be honest. Yeah. <laughs> get um, on top of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or get, or get on top of it. Um, yeah. W- which raises an interesting question. I, I, I'm just going to throw this out there because this is a, this is going to be a problem for this terrain piece. And it's a problem for plenty of other existing terrain pieces. Um, and, and that's the, the way the rules seem to work with, you know, kind of coming into contact for close combat so that you can have a guy sitting at like the top of a stairway. That's like, you know, one inch you know it's like one inch all around and you know he's standing at the top of the staircase and and he can like thumb his nose at the witch king on fell beast or Gulivar or whatever who can't actually get into combat with him because there's no place for their big heavy bases to balance on that staircase which always struck me as somewhat of a problem with those rules because obviously the witch king could just flap up and grab the guy off the top of the staircase but you know not in the game but yeah, yeah, and at the same time, they're not defending any elevated positions because they're not on the edge. Right. They're just like standing in the middle of it and, and you can't even land anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's that, still a loophole in the rules, unfortunately. I'd say I just one final thought on this. The only thing I would I'm gonna say like a bad part of this is like it is unfortunate that there's not a few more little terrain pieces to allow like you can actually because if you were building an omnihen board. The other parts you're going to need are like those statues and the heads that fall in and whatnot. Yeah. You're still forced to do 3D printed terrain for that. So if let's say I wanted to build an Amonhead board and that's it, those ruins are still going to be a problem for like someone who doesn't have access to a 3D printer or whatever. Um, so that's the only thing. And also, I think if they had added those extra little bits, that probably would have added to the rebuyability of this where I would buy multiple kits. Uh, Because now I get all these ruins and such that would come along with it. Maybe, you know, you can just, with your second one of these almond hens, you can destroy it or whatever. So that way, maybe that's a destroyed staircase, whatever you figure it out. But, but that's, that's the only thing I would say is like, it's unfortunate that now you, this doesn't solve the problem. It's a nice iconic piece, but you still need the rest of almond hen and you don't have it. I, I mean, I, I will say there are, even if you don't have a 3D printer, there are plenty of commercially available kind of ancient well, yeah. ruin yeah. type facsimiles that you could, you know, paint up in an identical fashion. And you could buy away. all of Lord of the Rings outside of GW. So, I mean, yes, any resourceful person will certainly get their hands on it. Um, I know I already have, and I have an Omnin board, clearly not a GW creation. Uh, so I agree with that. I'm just saying... I don't know if I was a person who wanted to be pure GW, you still have to look outside of it, even after buying this to the <laughs> ramen hen board. I well, I get, I, get the sense, I get the sense that um, for like a competitive tournament, that might be the case, but this is probably more meant for playing the narrative scenarios. And in that case, yeah. you have a very limited sliver of table that the ramen hen actually exists on that you play around. Yeah. So that's less of a problem. You just need a few trees. Right. That's I think probably. that's probably the idea there. Yeah. Yeah, it makes um, sense. I definitely want to take Urukai Scouts with this. Though. That would be so much fun to play on that board. With be great Urukai on display Scouts. boards too, right? Depending oh my goodness, size. that's a that's a great point as well for yeah, a display yeah. board. Um, all right, so we'll move on to the next thing, which is probably my favorite part of this whole thing is the Witch King. So basically, they released a new Witch King model, mounted and unmounted, and there's a lot of interchangeability. So as you see in this picture here on screen. You have the ability to make the Witch King without his crown or with his crown. And um, that's a nice little feature as well. The model itself is really nice. I'm not really getting the whole point of the pointing out the sword. Maybe that's just me. Um, I, I don't think it looks as menacing as the one where he was holding the sword up in the air. But I, I, I still like the model a lot. I think the horse with the armor looks really cool. Um and then if we go down a little bit further, the best part for me is the dismount version, mm-hmm. which has what everybody who has the Witch King wanted, which is the flail in one arm and the sword in the other, just like the iconic scene was in the movie. Um, 
this well is... that you will never take. Yeah, I was yeah, about, I was about to, to say. I, I, aesthetically, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's a, got, I it's got what people one. actually wanted, which is the ability to not take the flail on a witch king with crown <laughs> and yeah. be able to use the model so it's actually accurate. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the flail looks cool. I, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I'm probably going to buy this for the dismounted version. I'm probably not going to use this version. I'll probably use the armored horse version that the metal one because i just think that looks better mounted but this will definitely be my dismounted version of the witch king going forward i just think this is the one i've been waiting for i mean you've seen how many conversions have we seen where people try to make the flail work into the model and now they finally have that and and i'm just very excited about it but what are you guys thoughts i mean yeah the fact that the flail will never be played i mean I, i'd still use the model i mean Obviously, for me, I, I probably, you know, I think this is a good release. I, I, I'm not against the release, so I'm probably not going to buy it um, just because I do like the existing metal sculpts. I think replacing metal sculpts is probably a good idea for GW at this point. So you would need a replacement for the Witch King on a horse. So for anyone who's a little disappointed in seeing like, oh, why of all things this guy? That's probably the reason why. I think if I had to pick a resin model, I probably would have written a replacement for like, Shelob, <laughs> which is something which you know I, I was just saying that because i'm assuming that all of this is in co like was supposed to go inside with the um that felt i forgot there was a book or something i think that oh, come on, sir. huh Fold the yeah but the witch king's the not previous in. one quest of the ring bear yeah yeah there you go the quest of the ring bear i think i'm my assumption is that this was supposed to go inside with that i don't know maybe covid or whatever but if it is with the fall of the necromancer then i really don't I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the, you know, this model. So I'm assuming that, and then assuming that that's, what, yeah, but I mean, you know, the horse is fine. I think if I didn't own the witch King, I would love to buy it. Um, and I think, you know, it's nice that it can interchange and the fact that you can use it as a generic wraith if you really wanted to. Um, so, okay, cool. Um, I, I, yeah. I think that's, I mean, I think that's what I will end up buying it for because I, I've already got a, you know, mounted witch King that, um i i kind of like but um i may i may buy it just to have kind of a cool regular wraith or i guess witch king without crown mm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean the model to the left of, of uh him of the crown is actually a pretty decent looking model and it's even though They're it's all the same gorgeous models uh, yeah but yeah i should clarify that i like definitely not speaking against the sculpt whatsoever yeah no no no. there's yeah. there's nothing yeah, wrong with right. the sculpt at all yeah. it's, it's just a matter of you know do i need yet another witch king yeah I do think after rethinking about it, if uh, this is just me being very particular, I do think I would probably end up painting the mounted version simply because, you know, how you can take an armored horse or an unarmored horse. And even though he kind of has stuff on his head, that's really an unarmored horse. So I'd probably go through that route of going, well, here's my armored horse. Here's my unarmored horse kind of a concept. That's just me being weird about it. Um, I, I don't know that this is possible, but I suppose what you you know how people magnetize things. Maybe you could magnetize the head so that if you didn't take the crown, you could swap it very easily. I, I don't know how difficult that would be, though. I just think something like that would be really cool if you were able to interchange the heads at a whim if you had the crown or not. But yeah, it doesn't look like that's really possible. I mean, when I initially saw this, I was wondering if like you know you could re like remove the mortal crown, but it, it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like it's just a pull on, pull on thing. Is like the whole body almost. Like it's, it's yeah, it'd be tough to know. Well, yeah, so the, the, the mounted crownless is also useful for your Black Riders Witch King since right. the metal sculpt was a made to order and you can't buy it anymore. So if yeah. you need a Witch King for your Black Riders without crown, there you have it. There you have it. And okay. and that's where, why, once again, I think this was coinciding with that quest of the Ring Bearer where you had like the Ring Wraith Legion and stuff like that because that that's what seems to be this is for so we just so happen to see it at articon where we also saw uh fall of the necromancer i don't think there were well it's not just lord of the rings all of the products have been shifted because of covid and things yeah. things are no longer coming out when i think they were supposed to come out in yeah. general so i think that the plastic models for some time will probably no longer be tethered to the books just because of the way the releases got pushed 
Yeah. But I think it's a cool model. I'm going to buy two, honestly. And I'm going to build my <laughs> foot crown one with a flail. And if somebody gives me grief about it, that he's got a flail that he didn't pay for and I'm not using, he can fight me. So <laughs> so that would actually be interesting. It says the bonus arm they're not showing here, that they have him with the flail. Like, if it's like, I don't know. I don't know how you would wield that flail on horse, but theoretically. I'm I, oh, that'd be fantastic. I have, he's going like that. I have a Witch King model with the flail on the horse. Um, oh, there, man. there is an iteration of that out there. Um, and I can't remember. I don't think it's, I think it's a fine cast. Um, I, I don't think you, I think you may be misremembering there, dad. I misremember. We have the, Witch imagine King, we have the witch King with the sword pointed up. Yeah. Oh um, yeah. Maybe the fire I'm on of, the sword. Yeah. Maybe I don't, I'm I don't remember not. ever seeing a model with the witch King with flail on flail horse, on partially horse. because he never had it in the movies. So. Yeah. Well, it All would right. make no sense corrected. for GW to actually make the model, like from a film perspective, but just because you can arm him on horse with a flail, it, I mean, it makes like sense. Doesn't make any sense, but you know, I mean, it doesn't make sense in the movie that he literally pulls it out of his pants either, right? Yeah. So whatever. <laughs> Like he doesn't have it. He reaches <laughs> in his pocket and pulls it out. Like what? <laughs> yeah, here's my here, here's the flail that I was carrying in my pocket that happens to be the size of a Volkswagen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everybody has their pocket flail. That's how you know you really made him mad, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, like, you, you were sitting on that the whole time. time. <laughs> <laughs> it was so uncomfortable. Is that yeah. a flail in your pocket, or are you just happy to see me? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, uh, we'll move on to the next part, which is the Fall of the Necromancer book. So aesthetically, you got to like the look of Sauron there, of course. Um, you know, we've obviously talked about a couple models that they've announced will be in the book. Um, so that's good to see. I'm, I'm wondering from your guys' perspective, is there anything in particular that you're kind of hoping comes out from the book that they haven't maybe announced already? Uh, okay, so for not being announced, but also, I think there was one thing everyone was hoping for that was confirmed it is not coming, at least according to Facebook feeds, is that we are not getting a sculpt for the Necromancer. Yeah, that's correct. that would be my thing too. Fact, and fact, that, I think, is a major missed opportunity. I'm kind of thoroughly shocked like, that that was not, considering that the existing sculpt does not represent the films at all, to me, if anything should come out of this book, it should be the necromancer like and then everything else is just sort of like oh that was cool well i, I I'm very very shocked that that is not included I, I guess the I, I guess the problem was that they you know because of whatever production limitations warhammer has they could not put out any new figures to go with this book well so, not, so maybe it's so the actually, Rob, yeah rob was actually explaining that uh, uh during the seminar so uh i specifically asked uh, in the Q and A, if the if the necromancer is coming out, and and he said he's not, and um, this uh, this whole book apparently, like it wasn't necessarily something that they planned way way back. It was just um, GW was able to give them and an, like uh, like an additional space for 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 release of another book, and they thought, yeah, let's just let's just let's just get something else out. So this so, is wasn't that the same story as the the Shire book? So it much could have been. Like, yeah, I think they mentioned that. Although, although, I mean, one wonders. I mean, they they did a new sculpt of the Witch King, and maybe maybe it was just like a timing thing that the sculpt of the Witch King has been you know around for a couple of years, and they just finally got around to putting it out. But one wonders why they couldn't have done a Necromancer instead of a Witch King, and maybe it was just mm -hmm. because this fall of the Necromancer thing was like a last minute. Oh crap, we got to do a book in a month type thing. And this is, you know, this is some speculation here. I'm not saying this is actually happening, but GW has been known to hide details if it's not confirmed or 100%, like in order to not commit themselves to it. So it's possible they could be working on a Necromancer sculpt, but because of COVID and all that, it got pushed. And therefore, Rob is obligated to say no when they're working <laughs> on it. Um, I don't Can know. neither like confirm that. nor deny yeah. the existence of a necromancer. Oh, uh, Rob has straight lied to my face with abandon about that. I remember at Nova, I kept pestering him about, you know, when we're going to get a plastic AMR. And he's just like, we're never getting one. It's not in progress. And then what, like three months later, a plastic AMR. <laughs> so that's 100% what he's doing, even yeah. if it is in the works. Well, and I, I that's mean, what he has to do, right? Couldn't you yeah. tell when he, you know, when he gave that answer and he immediately started twirling his mustaches? 
and uh, <laughs> and then went off with. <laughs> I mean, that's usually the giveaway when Rob's lying to you, right? I mean, I couldn't see his face past his top hat, unfortunately. But we were <laughs> I mean, also that... on a railroad, so it was tough to see anything. <laughs> yeah. It sounded like he was getting squished by a house. I mean, that was that was like the wicked, wicked witch of the west tackle. Then, um, I, that's going to be my theory. Then I'm just making that theory and throw that conspiracy theory out there that uh, I think a necromancer. I think that's just such a pivotal piece that you would need to, but I don't know. But like, I think that it probably is so far pushed back due to COVID that he's just got to say no. I think we're uh, not getting a new necromancer at the time the book drops. Yeah. But there's no doubt in my mind that down the line, there will be a new resin character series for drilled necromancer to go with the nine they already sculpted. Once they finish re-engineering the uh, alien technology that will go into this new sculpt, from the area <laughs> from area 51 and the crashed ufo mm -hmm. it's gonna be a real expensive model because it comes packaged with them on hand <laughs> first off though the sculpt would be cool as hell like yes I, I was gonna book. say i've seen some on facebook where people made their own and if it looks anything like the ones on facebook it will be a fantastic because it's basically model. like a cracked armor lava spewing out sort of Sauron but like he wouldn't even be in a combat pose he would be more like kind of like he's standing there intimidating because my assumption is they'll model him off of the same scene the ring rays were modeled off of dual door where they're kind of like being summoned in and Sauron's just standing there so he's probably gonna be like this almost statuesque sort of pose if yeah. except it's gonna have Rob Alderman's head there you go <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> So, I mean, okay, so that aside, so we don't otherwise know any releases other than the, the terrain we're going to talk about. Um, I would think the fall of the Necromancer has everything you would need already. Because, I mean, you have the Dual Duel Race, they're released. You have the White Council or whatever, they're released. So there's nothing left. I mean, unless this is specific to the books, which this image doesn't allude to, then there are no other releases. And that, that, that's it. What else do you release? So oh, my only problem, if they do do the one from the movie where the, the wraiths are there, is in that scene, I don't know why, but Sauron doesn't have any feet. He has like pointed like things, like like the flames where the foot meets. I kind of hope that would get fixed just because I don't really get that, to be honest with you, why he just doesn't have feet. But other than that, I, I really liked what they did in the movie. Yeah, I mean, you were probably the only one watching Tim that was like. I it was like it popped out to me. I'm like, where's his feet? <laughs> he saw it through the epilepsy scenes. <laughs> um, okay. So I guess there's there's four legendary legions that are going to come out with That's this. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. there's there's like a, a Merkwood Rangers with Tariel and uh, Legolas. There's. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, the the there's necromancer the himself right? and his ring wraiths. Yeah, and then there's um, I guess there's something that's um, Azog and Co. Uh, so it's basically Azog inserted into a uh, you know dark denizens of Dol Guldur type list, and then um, and then I guess the last one is you know the the actual gang that shows up to take down the necromancer. So I'm looking forward to this Dark Denizens combo with Azog, if that's what it is. That sounds interesting. I'm not looking forward to this Rangers one. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't. I'm not going to say the whole rant about shooting again, but it's just like I fear if that's anything like if it's successful at being a competitive legion, then it'll be like a billion Rangers. Which no, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. I mean, here's I how so. it's going to be. It's it's either going to be complete trash and they're not going to be able to buff it enough. So it's just going to be useless anyways, though, I guess maybe a little bit better than if you took it in the actual list yeah. or it's going to be ridiculously broken. It's going to be like Rangers of Athelion. Everyone's going to hate it. So I no don't it's there's like there's no winning. There's <laughs> no winning here. It's, you have a defense it's very unlikely. army at 14 points. They have to be able to murder everyone at range. Yeah. Like, there's no other way to make that work. Unless you totally change the stats, which they've never done in any Legion, it's got to either suck or be great. Or too good. Like, yeah. It's not uh, going to be balanced. No the, way. The, the one that really puzzles me is the, um, the, you know, the White Council Legendary oh, yeah. Legion. Like, which... How do they make that? And that's exactly like... That, that's one of the things where, you know, when you take the Black Riders list, 
it, you know, I'm not saying it's going to win a tournament, but at least you're like, oh, this is actually somewhat doable now. How do you make yeah, the white it, council? It's, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's five figures. Um, and, uh, you know, you know what the five figures are. I mean, it's not, it's not going to be scalable. It's got to be, it, it's going to be like one of these, it, it's going to be a legendary legion like the, um, the breaking of the fellowship legendary legion where yeah, yeah, yeah. everything that's in it is set. Um, and you know, you, you basically, you play it at a certain points level and it has a, a bunch of, of special souped up rules. And so they did say, uh, that it's 800 points for five of them. For the five of them. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. So, okay. Boy, they so, better be really uh, good for five models at 800 points. Yeah. And so, uh, I would guess like there's just going to be a bunch of new rules for all of them. And so, yeah, yeah, it, it it just seems like a like like a strange one because again it's it's one of those where uh, it will probably automatically win certain scenarios, and then it will really struggle in other in other scenarios. Yeah, but so a lot of these weird yeah. outlier legions and armies do that anyway. Like, yeah. it, it like certain scenarios you're just not going to win again. Like Lords of Battle being the most obvious one that as soon as you put this you know them on the table they should win. And I'm assuming. They may give them enough rules where people like Gandalf can actually kill stuff. So, um, right. So yeah, they're going to be like that outlier that won't win a tournament, but will auto win or not win certain matches, certain scenarios. Yeah, yeah. It'll certainly be very thematic, though. So, and we'll move on to the last new thing, which is another train piece, which is the Dolgal Door train pieces. Um, there's a couple of pictures here. I'll keep going back and forth between them. I am very much a fan of these personally. I, even though, if you know me, I'm really into like Sauron and I really like evil things. I think that it just looks aesthetically much better. And to be able to have something like this from the movies, I know that um, I believe uh, Damien and them have tried to recreate a board like this. So I imagine, I don't know, I haven't personally seen it, but I think I've heard about it. So this is very very similar to the movies and i'm very happy about it uh, i love the little statue of the ring wraith right here like from the movie and you know you've got all the 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 staircase is perfect and all the the metal around the walls it's yeah very very good i'll be buying a bunch of these this is fantastic this yeah, this is right. easily this actually kind of surprised me I'm, I'm not gonna lie i would not have predicted this uh this was a great call because um it, you can actually adjust it to be various different things if you really wanted to. If you paint it the right way, this is more ruins too of like various other places. Obviously, the, the spiky things may cause a little bit of an issue with that. But yeah, but you could regardless. cover them with ivy or something like that, or cover exactly. a bunch of them with ivy if you wanted to. Yeah, this is a fantastic kit. It looks uh, convertible. It looks like you can have set it up in all kinds of different ways. I think this is excellent. I. And uh, anyone who knows me knows I'm going to be buying a whole table of these things. Yeah, the, well, these are going to these are going to be wallet drainers right here. Yeah, I'm definitely buying multiple because of the two magic words, plastic and modular. So yeah, yeah, this was a great call. How do you guys think this will function gameplay wise with with all the? I know there's pathways, oh, of course. You okay. don't want to fill your whole board with this. Like the quarter, oh no, I want to fill my whole board with you this. Fill the, you will, you'll take a long time to play a game as you constantly get in the ways and one at a time combat. That, that is no problem. <laughs> if, if if I were to do a four by four board with these, I probably number one, I'd probably do several of them where the top half is gone, right? Like so it's just like a little platform, mm -hmm. or maybe you cut it down or something. I don't know. But if I'm going to do a ton of these, I probably on a four by four, I might not put oh in this. I'm going off the scale of the models here. I'm thinking six, but in a competitive board. But if you put any more than that, you are dangerously in the territory of denying certain armies any mo like ability to move. You're gonna really be able to if like you put a oh, screw them. We didn't like those armies anyway. <laughs> there you, <go. laughs> you can you can go into borderline uncompetitive play here. Um, so I, I think. I think six is about that good middle ground, unless you get really creative on how you do it. But um, if you get to like eight to 12 of these things. Well, I don't think you double stack all of them. Like you said, like I think on a board, you might have 
two of the double stacked pieces and then maybe like four of the half, right? So yeah. that they're no different to whatever other ruin you're using. And there you go. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think can... you, I think you cluster some of them. So you have like kind of like one, you have like a built up area with like a courtyard and then, you know, some open space and then another area that's yeah kind of built up. So. And you can sprinkle some trees around and kind of fill some of those open glades if you need to. So. Mm -hmm. But yeah, otherwise, I think, yeah, you can, the best part is just like Matt said, you can fill them with a bunch of vines and stuff and start using them for ruins of Arnor, you know, or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, the different types of boards. So. And then finally, it says here on the article that anybody who was at the seminar got to look into the next one, which is Defense of the North. So Mick, if they spoke about this, what, did, what exactly did they say? They literally didn't give us any information on, uh, <laughs> on, on what new models are coming out. Or from <laughs> so did Rob Alderman just get up and say defense of the North and then just start cackling and twirling his mustaches again? <laughs> then the whole hall started chanting King in the North, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then Rob, Rob went back to, to tie a maiden down on some railroad tracks. <laughs> I don't think portraying um, the Middle Earth manager as a supervillain is a great uh, move for this podcast going <laughs> onwards, but we'll see. I don't know. If he'll oh, are you kidding? It. I'll never see him any differently. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Rob. I love you. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, so that's all the new stuff that got released at Articon. But speaking of Articon, Mick, if you want to just go over real quickly, uh, you know, a quick little how you did at the tournament um each round maybe and remind everyone what you took and your experiences there oh cool. yeah so Articon, uh it was oh yeah Matt, matt's gone already there you go. <laughs> um, he, he yeah. couldn't stand the fact that he wasn't there that he had to leave <laughs> exactly <laughs> no Articon was great um it was really really cool to be playing game again uh, after after COVID and after after everything that's happened over the last two years, it was just so nice, so refreshing to just see all those faces and all the people. So, so really, like, regardless of of, of how anybody did, just 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 for the sake of going and, and for the sake of meeting everyone, it was it was such a cool experience again. So um, hopefully next year there's gonna be like 250 people again. Um, this year, I think we had 77 or 75 in the end. It's pretty good considering like, like 77. That wasn't bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, was, it was really good. But like, uh, there was really good spacing uh, uh, between tables. Everyone had plenty of space. So in, in a sense, it may have been better than a, than a large one because everyone just had way more personal space. And um, I, I don't think they actually managed to overrun like a single round. Throughout, throughout the, the entire event, like everything was, was super smooth. And um, yeah, uh, I, think, uh, I think doubles run super smoothly as well. Singles run, run smoothly. Like uh, as far as I saw, like they, they didn't seem to have any, any issues, any problems with, with anything. So I mean, after uh, the last really round, I'm not surprised. The last one was so smooth. It was mm -hmm. like crazy. Like it was like nothing. But, oh, well, the, the, the computer system that they had, that, that program, I think. Maybe. Yeah, tourney yeah, never worked yeah, for me yeah, the whole tourney. tournament. So, yeah. so, so that's the thing. Like on on Friday at the start of doubles, there was like a little glitch, but then but after that, I think I uh, I don't think they had a single. Oh, it was the tournament before the last one. That's right. They introduced tourney on the last one. So it's a tournament. Oh yeah. That. So yeah, yeah, you're misremembering, yeah. Devin. There was a ton of problems. Yeah, there was a ton um, of problems. With internet yeah. and tourney. Mm. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's right. They, so it was the one before the fourth tourney uh, tournament, but that they introduced tourney, which I think was a good move. They, they needed to do something, but yeah, it definitely caused some issues. But with 77 people and they already tried the 20 software. So this actually almost yeah. is like a practice run for the next oh, yeah, year. Well, yeah, yeah. So. Actually, it definitely was a practice run because um, uh, obviously, obviously more people uh, couldn't really come. But, but then uh, the, thing, the thing I really liked about Tourney was that uh, you get paired, you see it on your app, and mm -hmm. then you also see the opponent's list. And, mm -hmm. and you hear what the scenario is. So like, as you walk into the table, you can already be reading mm -hmm. the list. And like, yeah. you may be paired like 15 minutes before the round starts. You don't actually have to find your opponent and, and figure out, oh yeah, what's, what's their list? What, what am I supposed to write down? Mm -hmm. Like, there was none of that um, time-wasting admin uh, things, yeah. which, which, which we usually run into. Um, and then also the oaths could be, could be sub could sub uh, submitted through uh, Tyranny as well. 
Um, so yeah, in terms of or, uh, organization, everything was just just completely spotless. So yeah, like a great great job by James and, and his team. Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, gameplay, um, I end up winning five and losing one game. Uh, my army, uh, for anyone who's seen the previous episode, it, uh, was essentially uh, Suladan, Gothmog, and Shilab. Uh, Suladan and Gothmog were, were, were leading for four, four warbands. So there was some run orgs, no orgs, uh, hard rim with bows, and serpent guards. So How the Shilab at 600 point tournament? No, no, uh, uh, Suladan got one. Suladan, yeah. Sa Saron and Shiva. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, in terms of the games, uh, yeah, all of my opponents were, 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 were like really, really nice too. Like, I, I, I think throughout, throughout all games, we had one rules query where we had to call a ref, and like it, everything just went super smoothly. Um, yeah, so I played some really nice people. Uh, the game I lost was actually against Harry Moore, who is one of the top UK players. And um, yeah, yeah, uh, he was actually on my team uh, when we won the ETC three years ago. So we had this situation actually, uh, we were playing each other in game two. And after, after the game won, I, I walked over to him to say hello. And I was just like, when can I murder your army? Where can I? <laughs> when can I murder you? And then uh, uh, it turned out that in game one I won by a score of six one, and I didn't get my oath. And and Harry also won six six one and get his oath. And just as we were chatting to each other, the pairings went up, and we got paired against each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then uh he proceeded to uh to absolutely de destroy my army it was um it was one of those those games where uh it was a domination game where he had uh gulavar and witch king on mm. on horse with crown mm. and like 30 32 orcs and a, and a specter i believe uh yeah uh, i think it was there was just just one specter um and yeah we we're playing domination so uh, it was always going to be all about heroes, and there was just this one one uh, round of combat where, uh, essentially, at the start of the turn, all of our heroes were actually able to charge each other, um, and he ended up winning a heroic a heroic move roll off, uh, where Gulavar managed to, to, to charge Sheila, then Gothmog got into the fight with Gulavar, and there was all this like heroic heroic strikes and and things, and it it essentially came down to the uh, to, to the point where Gulavar beats Gothmog and Shilob in combat despite me having a, a higher fight value. Then he murders Gothmog. Then Shilob suffers one wound and rolls a double one and runs <laughs> off. <laughs> and from that point on, I just get completely wiped the floor. <laughs> yeah, so um, from all the other games, um, every, yeah, like pretty much all of them were, were like really, really cool. Um, some some interesting armies, uh, quite quite a big variety. Um, even though I had thirty six models, which, as we talked on the last podcast, uh, we all thought that's actually pretty healthy, pretty decent numbers. I was outnumbered in three of my six games. Uh, one game I was playing against forty two model Arnor Force. Another one uh, against uh, the Wildman uh, Legendary Legion. And another one was against like a Hobbit and uh, Rivendell Alliance led by Glorfindel, which had like 56 or something like that. Um, yeah, so I suppose the, the, the only sort of downside which I saw throughout, throughout the tournament was that um, there was a system where you obviously score five points for a win, two points for a draw and zero for a loss. But instead of there being major minor, for scoring one uh, for scoring the oath, you got one additional tournament point. So essentially, if you were to score all six oaths uh, throughout the six games, it would count for more than one extra win for the for the tournament. So that's a, that's that was eventually what knocked me out of the podium, because uh, after after six games, winning five and scoring only one oath um, put me to eighth position. But had I scored three more oaths, I would have finished third. So it was it was just that close toward uh, towards the top where literally 
if you scored one extra oath, you were either going up or down a couple of positions. So I don't know whether whether that or like double victory points for for for, for major minor might be better. But yeah, it was it was just one of those things where suddenly, like you don't necessarily always think of oaths as your as your priority, but it looks like for this tournament and also probably going forward for for future articons you're really going to have to ensure you score every single oath. Otherwise, you're just not going to make it to the top, even if you win all, uh, uh, all of your games. Just so I'm understanding, the General's Handbook, does it have major minor victory as the second tiebreaker? Um, or, I believe yeah. it does. Uh, yeah, I believe it does. It does. Yeah. So Articon's actually going against uh, yes. the way GW's official format is. Yes. All right, that's unfortunate, I find, because... Um, I agree with you. I think the oaths are really hard to remember doing. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're, they're also so kind of random. Sometimes you just may not. Yeah, there are some opponent. really random ones. But but like the thing you say about remembering them, like the final game I was playing against David Clubley. So so that was basically our rematch of the century because like three three years ago, we were playing final game on table three. He won, he finished third. Had I won, I may have been like third, fourth or fifth or something like that. But um, essentially... We got to a stage in Fog of War where I almost tabled him, and just as the game ended, we were we were on the on the, on the final turn, and suddenly I was like, "Oh, my oath! What's my oath?" I checked. <laughs> yeah. I was supposed to. Uh, um, I had the uh, the Master of Woodland, so I was supposed to put three three models into any forest. And at that mm -hmm. point, even though I wasn't even broken, he had two models left on, left on the table. But at that point, I was only able to put two models into any forest. Literally, had I remembered the term before, I, I would have gone in the elf. So, Mick, I just want to ask you, just because um, I, I myself have not gone to Articon, and I want to clarify this just for anybody who doesn't maybe understand, what are exactly are oaths for anybody who doesn't know what those are? So, oaths are these additional secret missions which you pick uh, at the beginning of the game. Uh, normally, you select three of them out of the 12 that are in the General's Handbook. And, um, well, the, the, the match play guide, rather, not the mm -hmm. General's Handbook. And afterwards, your opponent rolls a dice, and whichever one gets picked is your secret mission for the game. So, so normally, in the match play guide, I believe it's, uh, it's just one of the tiebreakers. But in this particular tournament, uh, doing the, uh, uh, completing your, your oath gave you an additional tournament point. So for example, Tommaso, who was uh, one of our guests here in the, in the, in the past, um, he finished the tournament with four wins and two draws, but I believe he scored like either five or all six of his outs. So that, that, put, that put him to second. Whilst normally, uh, if, you, if you were on, on, on four wins and, and two draws, you would be behind people who are on five wins and a loss because of how the points get, get added up. Um, yeah, so so in a sense that was like quite quite different to what you know you would normally expect. So do you, so, all of you guys, because I know I think all of you have been to Articon. Are you a fan of this, or do you prefer that this not be a thing? I know I, it's, I I'm it's a decision, fan but... of it in as a minor minor tiebreaker. I think yeah, that they're exactly. too random, and then sometimes in the case like the one you mentioned, throw three models and some woodlands. Okay, like why does that award me points? Like, I, it's yeah. such an easy task to accomplish that you literally only wouldn't accomplish it if you didn't have the right army to accomplish. Like, maybe you had a three model army or something, or you know, or you didn't have any woods on your table. Which, well, that, yeah, that's yeah. exactly like what if you're well, playing on a hurrah board? What do you do? No, so, so to your, to your so point, Nick, without a cone. sorry, just to uh, yeah, just go ahead, to, just to answer the question, to Tim. Um, out of itself, um, this year. They had essentially four types of boards and all were quite generic. And so regardless what round you played, you played on, on one of the four boards that were that, uh, that were spread spread across across the room. So, so it's controlled in a sense. Yeah. So like yeah, all okay. of them had like, I think three forests, two buildings, and then uh, I think one of one of the four types had like these tents. And one of the four types had um, some sort of fences and, and fields and, and, and stuff Which like that. Which I actually like about Aracon. It, well, it so, makes the randomness of your table. And that yeah. sounds fantastic. But I guess my, and, and if they did this, fair enough to them. Is every board that you could possibly go on have 
woodlands. So if you pulled that, okay. So fair enough. I, you know, there's nothing to complain about at that point. Because as long as every single board has can be done in every single one of those oaths, then there's nothing to really complain about. I mean, at that but but then even even if it didn't, um, you still select your pool of three. So you don't have to choose the, the woodland one if you're if you if your board didn't have it. Oh, so you choose three and then they yeah, roll so to see which one you, you get. Oh, okay. Yeah, gotcha. You choose three and then they roll. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So that was random, maybe. When we were at Articon in uh, was it 2019? Now, God, um, I remember it was a little different, right? There was six possible ones to choose from, and you had to pick a different one for every well, game. That right? was before the general's handbook, right? Put yeah. out, yeah. So, so it worked a little bit differently when um, when we were last there playing. Mm. I mean, I'm, I don't think the oaths is a bad thing to have in a tournament, but I do. I would prefer the major minor victory condition version of it. Or I think you know me accomplishing the main mission, but by a, such a wider margin, is much more of an impressive accomplishment to me than you threw three guys in a wood. Yeah, I don't. I don't <laughs> particularly. I didn't particularly like the oath system when we were there um, last, and how that worked. And to your point, Mick, in my in my first game, I scored my oath entirely by accident because I had forgotten about it. But we played on a board covered in woods, right? So at the end of the game, I was like, "Oh crap! What was my oath? Oh hey, I scored it, right?" <laughs> um, and it was it was just pure happenstance that that happened to be the case. So. Yeah, I, I do think, though, like, I, I prefer that system over, like, strength of schedule, which is you compare your, like, let's say me and Mick are tied for first place. So we compare all of the placements of Mick's opponents versus mm -hmm. all of the placements of my opponents. And theoretically, if Mick's placed higher, then he would win the tie. I prefer the O system over that because you can't control mm -hmm. strength of schedule. So, I mean, as a third tiebreaker, I pick that, but not as a second one. So, Mick, is there anything after playing those games uh, that you would want to improve on the list that you took? Yeah, so I was really... Okay, so first of all, the positives. I was surprised how incredibly good Gothmog was throughout the entire tournament. It was literally like the best addition I've, I've had at that, at that point level. Tim is smiling because Tim, Tim loves playing golf. I love golf, so <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> like, um, I didn't play any particularly shooty armies, so uh, exclusion of Shadow Lord wasn't 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 an, an, a major problem. Plus, there was there was actually a, a quite a bit more terrain than than there had been on, uh, on the previous Articons, as far as I know. So um, there were situations where even though I only had like nine bows, my opponents would have twelve, and I would still be out shooting him because of my positioning. So um, Gothmog was actually extremely good in, in, in multiple situations, um, especially since very often people just didn't have enough my points and then I could still do my actions and I was then able to call additional actions. Like there was, uh, there was even a game uh, where I was facing against Gondor list where I think Gothmog got me like four additional my points um, where uh, normally I would just have to allow Boromir to just do his thing and probably just 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 ruin me. Um, so I would say, yeah, he was he was really good. But in terms of changes, I'm just not entirely sure whether Shelob is entirely viable at a 600 points. Um, I was thinking in, in there was, for example, a situation where uh, she almost she she kind of almost single handedly won me a game against against uh, an honor list in destroy the, the supplies, because I sent Shilob around my opponent's army, and he had to commit so many defenses and just like keep keep different things back. That even though he outnumbered me initially, um, I then managed to outnumber him actually in combat where it mattered. So so she was really useful in that. But I think throughout the tournament she maybe scored like six kills in total. Um, the whole dude, like combined, <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> and actually, the fi the final game against David, um, it was fog of war, and um, there was uh, one of the objectives in fog of war is um, either kill, yeah, uh, uh, you have to kill uh, one of your opponents' selected heroes, yeah. And he actually managed to send a single Creebane against She Love. <laughs> and and wounded her. Oh, God. <laughs> and that's what scored his victory points. Oh God! 
<laughs> yeah, the yeah. one yeah. dice is a little little. That, that does yeah. <laughs> that mean, does sound like Shelob. I I've used Shelob in the um the what's it called the the legendary legion that has her in it um where she gets you know an additional oh, yeah, attack the additional and then yeah. rerolls and she was still like a 90 point paperweight it felt like i was playing 90 points down while i was playing I, her and she really didn't sad. have her one attack weakness then and i think just having zero might and just the unreliability of her in general is just not good enough for yeah. me personally i mean yeah, I mean, there is a there there, there is a point that yeah, it, she 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 maybe not, isn't doing anything, but then I I felt like there were so many situations where because of her just being there, my opponents were not playing optimally. Even though I was like, I can't even get Sheila through these terrain pieces to actually charge properly. I can't even get her into the right spot, but my opponent might just be afraid that if she was to somehow get in there and roll well, the hero might die. Did Did you ever succeed in using Sheila? You know, basically to kind of bait out the might points of the opposing hero so that Gothmog could um, copy them. I did like in one game, but in all the other ones, I I felt like yeah, people people actually picked up on it. Um, Shilob also in in Recon, Shilob was my one model that managed to run off, which actually meant that I was able to win that game. <laughs> she is good at that. <laughs> yes, she is. She is really hard to stop when she wants to run off the board. But would three wargs riders? Well, well, same well, task. That, well, as I think, a single warg rider would have run off too in that in that situation. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's like, well, it, it's a lot easier to dedicate a force sufficient to stop yeah. a single warg rider than it is to dedicate a force that's sufficient to stop Shelob. That is true. Yeah. Well, I think I'm Shelob. Sure. She's she's only ninety points, and she has so much like potential. That a yeah. lot of people over devote resources to her and she becomes a great distraction, which is what it sounds, Mick, that's, like that, happened with you. That's exactly what happened in, in multiple games where like people were just like devoting a lot of resources, as you yeah. say. And then, yeah, suddenly from being outnumbered by like six models to start in, in actual combat, I actually outnumber my opponent. Yeah. Or there was a, there was a game uh, in uh, Commanding ba the Battlefield against an army of the dead. Uh, with uh, with Aragorn and the King of the Dead, and the thing happened which Devin thought might happen in the last episode, as in Shiloh entered in the wrong place and died in the first combat against the King of the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Um, however, that did mean that the King started the game in the opposite side of the board than Aragorn did. So then my army was able to just destroy Aragorn and all of his all of his troops. And then I was able to just go after the king afterwards and just and just spread the, the army across and I easily won the game afterwards. So maybe it was a sacrifice worth it. I don't know. I mean, I'll trade Aragorn for Shelob anytime, right? Yeah. Or rather Shelob for Aragorn. Yeah. yeah. So was so, there this might be a hard one to answer, me, but was there anything you maybe learned from the tournament that you didn't know before? Gothmog is awesome. <laughs> yeah, Goth Gothmog was actually pretty good at these points, and I generally thought um, instead of Shilob, maybe next time I would have taken Shagrad and dropped a. You're, a, you're a, just a, you're a, just a, sweet a, talking me, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you're, just, you're just trying to sweet talk me. I like it. It's good. <laughs> I mean, I've I've already made the list for six random points, which includes Gothmog, Siladan, and Shagrad. So if you want me to send you that list, let me know. <laughs> Nick, stop <laughs> flirting with me. Gosh. <laughs> At 600 points, that's pretty scary. <laughs> Those three in the same list. All right, so we're going to be going over to Matt and Evan's tournament that they just went to. So Matt, if you want to go over that real quick and then tell us how you did there. Uh, okay, so um, this was NashCon, which is uh, which is a tournament that's run by the Tennessee group. Um, Austin Featherstone was running it, even though I think he's in Texas now. He flew in to run the tournament in uh in Nashville, and uh, it's actually at a convention. NashCon is, I think, primarily a historical uh, convention, although it's got a bunch of uh, miniatures tournaments there, including um, Lord of the Rings tournament. I think we had, I think there ended up being 22 people there. Um, great bunch of guys, mostly uh, mostly local guys. Um, but it was a fun place to go because you know it was it was people I hadn't really played against. Um, 
and uh, this was the one where I yeah, it was an 895 uh, point tournament. I'm not entirely sure um, why it was 895, but it was you know so slightly more than 800. It's something to do with the pages in the two towers. In the two or towers, something yeah. like that, because it was too. It was very loosely themed around the two towers, the book. So, yeah. and if you recall, I took a a two towers themed list that had. Um, uh the uh the iron hills champions chariot and then the master and a whole bunch of like army of light down guys which you know as you know appear in the appendix to the two towers um and with galadriel too of course with galadriel too yeah so i i mean i'll just briefly uh go through my games um so the first game you know right out of the box we played contest of champions and of course i end up fighting uh uh adam handy who is playing uh the balrog and um, he had a Balrog, a Cave Drake, um, and uh, then I think he had Groblog and uh, some Bat Swarms and a, and a bunch of Goblins. So uh, that, that was a tough ask right out of the box. Um, you know, I, I will say this. The Chariot took down the Cave Drake, um, uh, got into the Balrog, and kind of in the climactic last turn of the game, or I, it wasn't quite the last turn, but it was really the, really the last turn where the game was decided. Uh, went into the Balrog. At that point, I had gotten the Balrog down to three wounds left um, by uh, a combination of some, some banishes, uh, some, some lucky wounds, um, crashing the chariot into it. And I think the Balrog actually took one wound from one of um, uh uh, Adam's prowlers uh, that you know threw a throwing weapon at somebody who was fighting the Balrog, and uh, managed to hit the Balrog and rolled his six five to wound and wounded his own Balrog. Mm. Um, but yeah, crashed the chariot into it, and um, uh, and you know at, at that point, Wallen was out of my Feely and Keeley both struck. Uh, they rolled a two and a three, so I couldn't get to ten. The Balrog rolled the six and. Uh, took down the chariot and uh, in so doing took enough you know, took enough wounds to double what Galadriel had uh, had put out so far um, so I ended up going down in that one uh, 7-0 the second game I played was against uh, Ian Terrell um, who was playing a Corsair army and we were playing Seize the Prize and uh, this is one where I walked up to the table noticed that there was a river running across the board on one side of the table from left to right and immediately sat down on the other side of the table from the river (laughs) and uh, Ian was nice enough to come and sit down on, on the opposite side of the table with the river between him and the prize and his army of exclusively Corsairs. I think he had about like 70 Corsairs in that, uh, that list. Um, And, you know, and of course the, the chariot was able to kind of like trot up uh, next to the prize. Somebody ran up next to the chariot, dug up the prize, handed it to Balin, Ballin stuck it under his arms and said, go boys, go. And, you know, off the chariot went, uh, you know, right, right through the center of the Corsairs and out the other side. Um, so, uh, so that one was a victory. Uh, the third scenario I played against, um, uh, hang on. I've got my list here. Before you go to the third one, did, yeah. did he actually stand in the back and just wait for you to pick up the prize? Is that No, no, no. He was coming forward. And, oh, okay. You know, so he marched and all trying to stop. Yeah. That. He, situation from happening yeah i mean but i mean they're 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 just what because he had the river between you know him and the prize yeah and i was able to march the 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 chariot up um and be you know basically like right next to it on the the first turn and then the second turn just ran up grabbed it and so it's hopeless basically yeah i mean and then there are a bunch of, of strength four guys who are you know trying to stand in front of this chariot that's doing three strength six impact hits or you know defense four guys so you know, the chariot kind of like went right through them and out the other side, leaving a smoking chariot sized hole in the middle of that army as it as it proceeded to drive off the board. Um, and, and I think actually I think he actually he quartered before the chariot got right off the board. And, I th- and we misunderstood the victory conditions. We didn't realize that the, that particular scenario ends when both sides are quartered. Um, so I think I ended up with a 10 zero. But, you know, the next move, the chariot would have been would have been off the board. Um, the next scenario was divide and conquer. So this is the one where half your army starts in one corner, half the army starts in the other corner. The other, the other player has the opposite two corners. You're trying to basically run to the middle and then a couple of 
wing objectives, and I was playing against Andrew McCormick, who had a, a near far Harad um, alliance. And uh, you know, we discussed this after the fact. Um, uh, Andrew, he basically had the betrayer and a whole bunch of guys in one corner, betrayer, and then a captain or you know whatever the Mahood chieftain type guy is on foot on one corner with a whole bunch of guys. And then he had a, a, a Mahood king on camel and Suladan on the other side. And the betrayer wing, you know, kind of got off to a slow start and took a while to get to the center of the board. Uh, while my guys were just, I mean, I, this was like one of the scenarios this list is designed for, because we had the chariot and Galadriel kind of rolling in from one side. And then all the Lake Town guys with Braga calling march after march, you know, free march after free march to kind of get to the middle got to the middle the chariot turned on the side that had um Suladan and the uh Mahood king ran them over and then the whole army turned and killed the betrayer as he showed up it, it did have a it did have a fun moment when braga one shot the betrayer um where the betrayer called a heroic combat um charged into braga um flubbed his die roll braga rolled a six and then on the wound um you know, Braga rolls the six to wound and the betrayer proceeds to roll a two and then a one on his fate and goes poof. Um, so that was a fun moment for Braga there. Uh, and then the fourth game, fourth game I played against Dylan and let me make sure I get his last name right. Dylan Hudson. And uh, he had, he had, this was uh, Ugluk scouts and he had, this was another like 70 figure uh, army. And um uh, we had, you know, so this was this was going to be a problem, um, but I figured as long as the as long as the chariot could get off some charges and run over some of these soft squishy guys, I'd be okay. Uh, on the first turn, he managed to. We had a, a kind of a misunderstanding about a train piece, um, and he he got a guy he got a guy into the chariot on the first turn. And I figured, all right, that's fine. You know, the the uh, you know he can I'll, I'll be able to move you know the chariot the next turn and proceed to run him over. And of course, for the next four consecutive turns, I lost priority or lost the heroic move roll off. So the chariot ended up moving once during that entire game. <laughs> and uh, and to add to add insult, to, you know, so the chariot was sitting there killing a guy a turn while the rest of his army just kind of swarmed and annihilated everything that wasn't riding on the chariot. And to add insult to injury on the last turn of the game, I was broken. Um, I foolishly, instead of calling the 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 chariot's heroic move with um, Balin, I called it with Braga, and uh, I actually did manage to win the heroic move off um, for that one. And then Braga, of course, has to roll his courage check, rolls a two, and runs off the board. So the chariot's sitting there going, "What should we move? Should we not move?" Um, yeah, so I, I went down in flames in that one. Um, and then the last, the final game. Um, was against uh, Tim Asselton, who's a uh, really nice guy out of Atlanta. He's a Canadian originally, and then moved down to Atlanta. He came up, he was running a, uh, it was kind of like a battle of five armies themed game. So we have Gandalf and some Lake Town militia. He had um, Thranduil and some elves, and he had Thorin and uh, some dwarves. And Apparently, in, in this particular alternate reality, uh, the master had gotten to Dwalin and paid him off. So, you know, Dwalin and his chariot buddies basically said, you know what? Screw Thorin. We're going to make we're going to make the master, the king under the mountain and, and led an insurrection. Uh, and in this one. So there was a there's a terrain piece in the middle of the board that was basically like two halves of like a ruined fortress strike type thing. So the chariot was able to kind of like run into this basically use it as a garage where the, the Lake Town folks were able to get in and basically surround its flanks and defend this building. And then it came like storming out of the, the garage, like the Batmobile out of the Batcave and uh, into the center of the, the line. And by the time, by the time it was done, um, Dwalin and the chariot had minced uh, Thranduil, Thorin and Gandalf. Um, and, you know, most of their, their retinue so the chariot did what it was it was supposed to do in that game so i guess my takeaway from this is i, I had forgotten just how much of a nail biter it is to play this army and play this chariot because there's a point that you reach in every game where you realize 
you know, th- this game is going to be decided or, or could easily be decided on the result of this like heroic, you know, basically on a the result of a move off die roll. And I had forgotten how kind of heart wrenching that is to see that and see that die go down. And cause you know, it's like, if, if this chariot gets in another move, like the game's over. Whereas if he, if this chariot doesn't move and he swarms this chariot and takes it down uh, or swarms the rest of the army, the game's over and you're sitting there going, yes, or I'm screwed. Um, and, uh, I mean, that's, that's definitely what happened in all of these, all, all of these scenarios were blowouts one way or the other, where, you know, it was either like a 10 to 12, zero on one side or, a, or a, like a zero to seven or a, or a zero to, tw- to 12 on the other side. And that is, that, that's the nature of the chariot, but it was, it was a lot of fun to play. Yeah. Sounds about right for the chariot. Yes. <laughs> you already won. Cause you brought the chariot. And that's yeah, all that matters. Right. <laughs> It, it, it turns out you didn't lose the tournament. You won because that was the rule. If you take a cherry, you automatically get first place. Technically, I won the tournament. <laughs> it was the most thematic army. It was where they hitched Amon Hen to the chariot and dragged it into Lake Town, right? <laughs> yeah, well, well, all right. So you're going to get a chance to talk to the actual tournament winner. So I'll turn it over to Evan and he can talk. Well, I guess I'll talk about my uh, now second place army because the chariot <laughs> <Technically>. got first. <laughs> Um, I will. Yeah. I will have to probably disappear for it, but I know that you won, which makes sense because you brought a normal army. So, <laughs> <laughs> so congrats! But uh, but all right. Um, looking forward to listening to it on the podcast itself. So I'll we'll see you guys. Take care, Devin. Bye, Devin. Yeah. So um, I guess just going over very quickly my army, super similar to the eight hundred point one. Uh, I've already gone over it before, but instead of orc spears, there were Moran and orcs. There were a couple of trackers in there. The Witch King had a Morgul blade, which I will talk about later and how that was the best purchase of my life. Um, and I had a ring wraith, a basic wraith, instead of an orc captain. So game one is Contest of Champions against Smaug and the Witch King. <laughs> so... If I was taking any other army in the game, I would have picked up my dice, thrown them across the room, screamed to the sky, ran out of the tournament, and never come back. But (laughs) I had taken the Morgul Blade on the Witch King. So we deploy in Contest of Champions. um, Smaug sort of towards the center because he has to be. I just ball up in the center with my warriors basically just being used as speed bumps so he can't go and charge any of my important models uh, like my casters or the spider queen or the bat swarm or anything like that. Uh, The witch king sort of deploys in the back. Uh, We have a rather important heroic move off on the first turn. I know what Um, those are about. Yes, you most certainly do. Um, which I lose, which, you know, isn't great, but I'm like, I think I can still deal with this. So the Witch King flaps around, uh, casts some sort of random spell. I think it was like a Drain Courage or something, whatever. I didn't care. Witch King didn't charge in. Smaug ran backwards uh, out of uh, charge range of my Witch King on Felbeast. Um, and then my basic Wraith goes up, casts a Compel on Smaug, uh, I throw, I think, like three dice at it. I managed to roll the six. Uh, Smaug picks up his free die and his resistant to magic will, it, which was confusing to me because if I get this compel off, I'm going to charge him and kill him. Um, but he only picks up his two dice. Uh, he rolls a three, decides not to spend all three of his might points. I compel him forward, charge him with the Witch King and a Bat Swarm, and I Morgul Blade him. So turn one, uh, his leader is al- his 700 point leader is already dead. So uh, the game lasted for two more turns uh, in which I was just running around and killing his Witch King. So I ended up uh, tabling him, uh, which I guess in their rules ends up being an automatic 12-0. So I'll take it. Um, and that was that. Uh, game was over in like 30 minutes. So... I don't know. I don't know if there's like a record for fastest <laughs> games, but that was that was pretty close to that. 
I thought mine, I have one at um, Nova. It ended in 40 minutes. I thought mine was one of the quickest. My goodness. <laughs> I mean, that is, talk about one of the best and worst decisions. Taking the Morgul Blade on one end and what on the other end, right? <laughs> So uh, this this kids yeah, so is why was, you take the Morgul blade. Yeah, that's right. That, and this kids I, I is why you spend the mic. Why you take the Morgul Morgul blade? <laughs> although well, I would note you aren't taking it to DC. Although Smaug is banned there. Yes, so. part of the reason is Smaug is banned, and another part of the reason is I just didn't have enough points um, to be able to fit it in. But uh, I'm just gonna spoil it that i did not use the morgul ra- blade for the rest of the tournament but it did not matter because this turned a auto loss into an auto win so well, actually actually there we go had, had you even not taken the blade you would have still probably gotten smoke forward you would have charged him with spider queen and the witch king you would have struck up or well no uh, you already had a bot swarm chances are you almost would have killed him anyway um, I wound him on sixes with my monsters, and there's no way around that. And he's got 20 wounds, and I can't trap him. So I may have been able to win. Um, but chances are he was going to get like the one or two kills he needed, and then I wasn't going to be able to table him in time. Um, and I was going to lose. I mean, but, if, he, if he kills that bat swarm, I mean, yes, he saw smoke strikes, but that makes it a lot harder because he can just strike back as well. So if he did get that one turn, like Evan was saying, and he kills that bat swarm, it's pretty hard to imagine him winning that at that point. I mean, I mean still, if you, uh, like, as long as you table him, you still win, even, even, even if he scores like 15, 15 victory points or like 50 even. So yes. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Actually. Well, but... it turned from it turned a very stressful game that I may or may not have won, and was going to be extremely uh, horrifying to a game that lasted thirty minutes um, and three turns. So I'll take it. Yeah, it turned uh, a turned a stressful situation into a classic prison shank, right? Yeah, it's it's like you it's like you go and you you, you go forward. And you just kind of hope that you get that one hit. It's like, oh, all right, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I do kind of feel bad for Richard because it was so quick. But, I mean, he did bring Smaug to a tournament. He, like, he can't feel too bad. He brought that Smaug and happen. just ruined his chances. <laughs> ruined his hopes and dreams. And then the poor guy played nothing but Return to the King the rest of the day and just quit Lord of the Rings, right? <laughs> Can you imagine if he did, if that were the scenario? You bring Smaug to a tournament, you pay all this money, you paint him up, you do all this, mm-hmm. and you take him to a tournament and you get those scenar- that exact scenario happen. He just oh. keeps getting booped on the nose by the King of oh, the Dead, yeah. That would be horrible but anyway continue well uh moving on to game two um so that 12-0 win uh meant that i was uh i think i was on table one anyways uh table one luckily because of the way the tournament worked they were able to switch around tables so i wasn't just stuck on table one this entire tournament which i appreciate um so game two was on table one, though, and it was against uh, Christian and his Angmar list, which was extremely unusual in the fact that there was no Witch King uh, and no Orc Captain. So it ended up having Gulivar, the Shade, and two Barrow Whites, and then just a bunch of Orcs. Uh, I think it was like two-ish Spectres, um, some Wild Wargs. It was like 50-ish models or something like that. And what and shocked might. me, what, yes, it was basically zero might points. Um, and what shocked me the most, two cave trolls, which I could not comprehend seeing as instead of one, of, well, first off, Shade doesn't help cave trolls. So that was mm-hmm. a little weird in the first place. Second off, for I think 30, 35 points more, you can get Birder, who has three might points hits almost as hard, a little less hard, because he doesn't have the um, two-handed weapon in Burly. Um, but he get he benefits from the Shade special rule and doubles your might count. So that was a little confusing there. Um, but either way, uh, it didn't matter, because it was Seize the Prize. 
Um, on turn two, I got into the center, grabbed the prize, passed it to the Witch King. And on turn three, I uh, lost priority, charged the Witch King out, uh, compelled a guy, called a heroic combat, moved within 12 inches of the board edge. And then the turn after that, I ran off the board and won 7 0. Um, so that game was longer than my first game by about 15 ish minutes. Um, and yeah, it ended fairly quickly. I did have the opportunity um, to try and stick around, maybe try and break him or uh, kill Gulivar. But I decided, you know what? I've already got plenty of victory points and I don't want to risk losing. So I'm just going to take this major win, run off with the 7 0, and I'll be happy. Um, so game three was against Ezra, who. This who had Ents actually, um, so it was Three Beard, Quick Beam, Beach Bone, and then three Ents on top table game three, which was quite impressive, uh, I might add. Um, but uh, it did not unfortunately end up going well for him. We played Divide and Conquer, Tree Beard and an Ent deployed on one corner. Um, and then the rest of the Ents, including Quick Beam and Beach Bone, deployed on the other corner. Uh, all of my uh, special units, so like Spider Queen, uh, Witch King on Fell Beast, that sort of thing, they all ran off towards Treebeard. Um, and then the rest of my army just started moving in on the objectives and divide and conquer. Uh, and then the first turn of combat was extremely unfortunate for Ezra because what ended up happening is Treebeard was up against a rock wall and she was near another Ent. So I charged in on the Ent with the Spider Queen and the Witch King called a strike with the Spider Queen and a combat with the Witch King killed the Ent and then Treebeard uh, neglected to call anything. So I charged into Treebeard trapped him against the wall, and killed him too. So uh, the Spider Queen and the Witch King ended up killing the Ent and Treebeard in one turn, um, which nearly ended up breaking him, actually, because Merry and Pippin fell off of Treebeard and they were sitting there. Um, and then the rest of the game didn't go well for him either. I killed beach bone with black darts just completely just black darting him all the time i ended up killing him there uh ended up uh striking some more ends doing some more damage killed off another one with black dart managed to balance breaking him uh for sh as shortly as possible so i just sent an orc over to pin mary and pippin uh to stop him from breaking and then uh on the last couple of turns i ended up tabling him and getting the 12-0 that way. So um, that game was, I think, over an hour. So that's an improvement there. Um, I've gotten close. I think at this point, I've ended up playing a full game uh, time-wise because the game was two hours and 30 minutes in length. And I played 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and then like an hour, 15 minutes. So... I hadn't exactly been playing a lot, but uh, day one ended up going pretty well for me. Uh, so game four was against uh, Adam, who was the same guy that had the Balrog and the Cave Drake that uh, Dad played against in the first game. And this was definitely my toughest game. It was uh, Breakthrough, I believe it's called, which had the four objectives uh, on each part of the board. Uh, so the main strategy uh, that I had going into this was for my army, which consisted of Moran and Orcs and Black Numenorians, to just sort of walk through and crush his goblins while I either transfix his heroes or just try and minimize their damage as much as possible. And that's basically how the game went. Uh, I hit My army sort of crushed through his. The Balrog got transfixed a couple of times. Cave Drake didn't do all that much. I did have a couple of unfortunate uh, rulings, though, uh, from Matteo's standpoint. 
So the first one that kind of bugged me was I was trying to charge the Balrog because I had called a heroic move. So each of my warriors goes in, tries to charge the Balrog. Uh, I fail seven courage tests, something like that, to charge the Balrog. So I'm like, okay, screw it. Shadow Lord, it's time for you to die. Charge in on the Balrog. You need to stop him. So the Shadow Lord charges in. And I formulate a plan. I'm like, Balrog's got a free heroic combat. I don't want him heroic combating. So the Shadow Lord is going to also call a heroic combat. And as it says in the FAQs, if the Shadow Lord succeeds in calling the heroic combat before the Balrog does, the Balrog's heroic combat will be canceled. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, uh, my opponent disagreed with this. So we called the TO over. And the TO just immediately says that that's not how it works um, and that that's, that's it it's not that FAQ. way. And the problem was I didn't have access to the FAQs in any timely ma manner. So I just assumed, all right, sure, that's fine. Uh, the Balrog's not really going to be able to do much with this heroic combat. Uh, so I'll just let him have this. Um, so he does that. He gets his heroic combat off. He charges the Bat Swarm and then hurls the Bat Swarm into the Witch King on Felbeast, uh, which confused me greatly um, because, I mean, that does nothing, right? You hurl into a Strength 6 model, it doesn't knock you down, it doesn't do anything like that. He was under the impression that it does knock you down because he was a cavalry model. Like, okay, call the TO over. Uh, we argue about uh, the specifics of Hurl for like 10 minutes, did you and reference then the, the book? Yes. Uh, we do reference the book, and then the TO rules it his way. So the Witch King is knocked off of his fell beast and is now prone on the floor. Um, by the way, neither of these rulings are correct. No. Um, no. If, if you hit a Strength 6 Monstrous Cavalry model, um, it is not knocked prone. That rule only applies when a model is passed through. And a strength six model is not passed through because the model stops when it hits that strength six model. But anyways, despite uh, a couple of setbacks uh, happening there, I ended up being able to uh, grab all the objectives. Uh, some of them were contested, some of them weren't, and I ended up breaking him. So it was a 7-0. Uh, it was a tough fought game and Obviously, I wasn't super happy about um, the way some things were ruled, but I mean, it's okay. That's just how things happen sometimes. So going on to game five, I played against an Iron Hills list piloted by Alex. And uh, so it was Fog of War. I picked the Goat Rider Captain uh, to kill. And I protected the Shadow Lord. I was grabbing one of his back terrain pieces um, and then obviously you were trying to break the opponent. So went into the game. He had a chariot, Dane, the goat rider captain, and then a bunch of uh, normal warriors and guys on goats. Uh, played a couple of turns. And then on one turn, I saw an opportunity, managed to compel the goat rider captain forward, charge him and kill him. So I got those points. Uh, next turn. Uh, Dane tried to go and charge into the Witch King. Um, and then the Spider Queen and the Bat Swarm uh, flew over, called a heroic combat, and the Spider Queen hurled a, uh, an Iron Hills Dwarf into the Witch King's combat, knocking everybody over except for the Witch King. And uh, Spider Queen went into Dane uh, along with the Witch King. And what ended up happening is Dane did win the combat, uh, because I didn't call a heroic strike because there was a chance he could just copy it. But next turn, he was completely out of might and I was able to kill Dane. And my opponent decided to call it there. Uh, we sort of did like a sort of informal way of figuring stuff out. Uh, we went, okay, are we going to get this objective? Am I not going to get this objective? That sort of thing. And we ended up agreeing on a 12-4 win to me. I was almost definitely going to break him. Uh, I had already killed the leader. There was no way he was getting to the Shadow Lord. 
and uh, he had nobody guarding the back objective, and I had the spider queen with broodlings, so I was definitely going to grab that. And then uh, he was probably going to protect his chariot captain because I had no intention of going after the chariot, and uh, he was going to probably outnumber me on on his objective, but not uh, but not be able to fully win it. So uh, in the end, uh, it was five major wins. Uh, a bunch of victory points and a, a good time. And well, obviously first place, but it was a lot of fun. So That's... that means that after, after Tim's win, now your win is, is there a tournament the podcast hasn't won yet? Well, um... Articon. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <I messed> yeah. <laughs> <up>. <laughs> that awkward one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but okay, so Evan, I'll ask I'll ask one question um, before we wrap this up. Is there anything you learned from the tournament? Was there anything that maybe you didn't know before that you learned afterwards? Um, well, I definitely learned a whole lot about the U.S. meta, which is um, well, probably because of the pandemic. There's not a lot of like super optimized army lists. Um, the only Galadriel Lady of Light there was piloted by my father. Um, I think there were only like two elven army lists, so I and I never played them, so that was a good matchup for my army. Um, and I think in the end, it was a, a combination of, uh, I guess me being a little bit more experienced in the game than a lot of the uh, than a lot of other people there, along with my list being very well matched up with them, and being lucky with draws uh, and how I was paired against other people. Uh, that ended up uh, winning me the tournament. Uh, well, congratulations again. And uh, Matt, my condolences, although you did do well yourself and you took what I think most people would consider to be one of the most fun models in the game. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm sure you had a blast with it. Well, uh, it's no signal tower, but you know, it's still fun to play. <laughs> <laughs> and Mick, again, congratulations to you. I mean, what did you say? Eighth, was it? Yeah, such a failure, right? <laughs> Don't worry, don't, know. don't worry, Mick. Almost... Eventually, you'll win a tournament. <laughs> so, so again, congratulations to yourself, um, and and hopefully, um, everyone had a great time at their tournaments. And uh, just as a reminder, everyone, um, if you're looking for our lists, we'll put them up on the Facebook page. So look into that. Um, leave any lists you like for us to review in future episodes, and if you have anything you'd like for us to speak about, leave that as well. And we look forward to seeing you guys next week. Bye. Bye, guys.